Welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Freightways. And we're excited to be here and happy to present this webinar in partnership with Convoy, which is dedicated to utilizing technology to bring reliability, transparency, insights, and efficiencies to the tr trucking and supply chain industry. Today's market update is going to touch on many of the different factors affecting freight today, and we'll be hearing from Fre FreightWave's Chief Economist, Ibrahim Bayan, as well as Zach Strickland, our Director of Freight Market Intelligence. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to reach out to our team via the chat function on your Zoom control panel. Also, if you have questions for our presenters, you can enter those through the questions box in your, your uh, control panel. We'll also be sending a link to the recording of this webinar, so if you'd like to view it on demand or share it with your peers, you'll be receiving that in the next 24 hours. And so at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ibrahim and Zach to share their insights on the latest factors affecting freight today. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, so Zach and I are just going to start uh, by looking at some of the recent trends that have emerged in the economy and in freight markets. Uh, just a little bit about Freightways. Uh, for those of you that, that have, have been following us, you know that we try and build um, you know, not only a, a, a great amount of data that we can share with you all, but also a considerable amount of industry expertise. Um, we've, we've scaled up our operations quite a bit over the last year, uh, and we continue to try and bring in industry experts in to help give additional insights. So just a quick rundown of what we plan on covering today. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start off today by catching up on some old data. If you remember the last time that we got together for our market, uh, our market update, there were quite a few pieces of economic information that were missing that got delayed because of the government shutdown. And so some of some previously un unavailable data has now come in. So we're going to go through some of that uh, quickly. It'll cover activity towards the end of last year. Uh, then I'm going to dig into the first quarter performance, see how the economy is holding up in the start of this year and, and what the outlook is for the, for the early part of the year. Uh, some concerns that we see emerging out of the industrial sector of the economy uh, that I plan on touching on uh, and then dipping into recent updates in policy. I mean, it's only been a few weeks since the last time we, we met, but uh, quite a bit of changes have occurred both on, in, on fiscal policy, trade policy, and monetary policy. So we'll cover that. Uh, and then Zach will cover some of the trends in freight capacity, pricing, and regional freight patterns uh, in the United States economy. So just at a very high level, um, I, I think the overarching theme for the macro economy is that it's pretty clear that the US economy is decelerating. Um, a lot of the delayed data releases, the data that wasn't previously available that's available now, uh, came in well below expectations, showing especially for those things that, that tie uh, more directly to freight demand in the economy. So it's, our outlook is a bit darker than what it would have been uh, a few weeks ago. Um, on a more positive note, the government managed to avoid a second, uh, a second government shutdown, so we're all happy about that. Um, and there are some possibilities that are emerging that there's, that there's a trade deal on the horizon with, with China. Um, you hear some conflicting reports on, on both sides as to exactly how far along they are in negotiations. But there is some, some reason for, or at least some potential for optimism on that front. Um, on the capacity side, I think signs are pointing towards increased capacity within the trucking industry. Uh, and that's going to have implications for, for sort of pricing power and rates within trucking. So yeah, the freight market is, is pretty much doing the same thing that we're seeing in the economy. Uh, we're seeing volume slightly down uh, since the start of February, just down 0.1%. So it's relatively flat, uh, which is something we kind of expect, but at least it's not dropping with any kind of rapid uh, deceleration. Capacity is up slightly, 0.6% since the start of uh, February, indicating that you know everybody is still flooding into the market. There's plenty of uh, space to go around. So digging into the current economic situation, I have here U.S. gross domestic product. Uh, the blue bars are just the quarter over quarter growth rates, so sort of the momentum in the U.S. economy. And then the, the black line is the year over year growth rate. Uh, and the one thing that's, that's pretty clear when you look at the quarter over quarter numbers is that the economy is losing some momentum. You can see the second and third quarters of last year, 4.2% and 3.5% growth. Those are some of the strongest back-to-back -back quarters of growth that we've had since the recession ended. Um, but the data from the fourth quarter indicates that growth is going to be quite a bit slower. And I think some of the early results from the first, first quarter suggest that it's going to be even slower uh, when those numbers come in. Now, normally at this point, we, at this time of the year, you would know what the fourth quarter 
uh, GDP results are, but this is one of the, the pieces of information that's still been delayed uh, in the aftermath of the government shutdown. So we don't really know what fourth quarter GDP is just yet. Uh, but we expect 2.4% for the fourth quarter, then a little under 2% growth for the first quarter of the year. In year-over-year -year terms, you're still looking at pretty strong growth, 3% uh, year-over-year. Um, that's strong by, by any kind of measure, uh, especially in this post-recession era. That would be considered very strong year-over-year -year growth. So some positives for the first quarter. I think when you look at the international trade data, and we'll dig into this some in a bit, um, at least from an economic growth implication standpoint, um, I think it's been pretty positive. The, the, the trade deficit narrowed pretty sharply in the most recent data. Uh, and so that's good news for, for, for growth, uh, growth prospects. I don't think there's going to be much of a drag from international trade as there was, say, in the, in the third quarter of last year. Uh, and also there's a decent contribution coming from government. Um, even with the government shutdown, I think the amount of federal government spending is, is, should add a good amount to growth. Um, but there's plenty of weaknesses in the first quarter as well. I, I think it, it, it seems pretty clear that business investment spending has slowed down quite a bit since the end of last year, the beginning parts of this year. Still not much of an indication of any significant contribution from the housing sector. Um, that's been one consistent area of weakness over the past several quarters, and I don't think that changes much in the first quarter. Uh, and then you have the direct implications for the government shutdown. Uh, which will probably suck a couple uh, tenths of a percentage point from first quarter GDP growth. Uh, and so if you think about the first quarter, I had 1.7% uh, as the growth forecast. I think if, if, if the government shutdown wouldn't have occurred, it, it would have looked closer to 1.9 or 2%, and then the government shutdown itself sucked a couple tenths of a percentage point away from it. So digging into some of this data that was previously delayed, I wanted to start with international trade. Um, and normally, if you're talking about like end of year trade activity, uh, it usually doesn't raise a whole lot of eyebrows, but there were some pretty significant movements in the November data that came in. You can see here, um, the white line here is export growth year over year, and then the orange line is imports year over year. And in both cases, both exports and imports saw a severe decline in growth um, for, uh, for, for goods movement there. Now, again, from an economic growth perspective, what really matters is what, what's happening with the trade deficit, and the trade deficit got got uh, got more narrow, and so that means that that's that's really a positive when you're thinking about like what that means for GDP growth. Uh, but it's a it's a much more it's a much different perspective when you look at it from a freight uh, point of view, uh, because you know if you're if you're involved in transportation, you want goods flowing in and out uh, of the economy, and it doesn't really matter what the size of the deficit is. It's much more important like how much is leaving and, and coming in. And so this is it's a positive story from a growth perspective, but it's a negative story from a freight demand perspective in that you're seeing a turn, just a, a significant slowdown in both export and import volume. Um, now, again, we, we had kind of warned of this over the past several months that when you looked at import performance, it had stayed pretty strong leading up to the tariff, sort of in anticipation of some of the tariffs. Um, but there was, you know, we, we had kind of warned that there was going to be a payback at some point in time um, where companies were going to decide that they didn't need to import more and store it in inventories. And so it appears that, that, that that's kind of upon us. Uh, and so that's part of the reason behind the shutdown. And the same sort of thing happened on the export side. There was a run up in export growth in, in anticipation of some of the tariffs. Uh, and then once you got to the other end, you saw some payback and in, in, in a slowdown in export growth. And so. Again, this is good news for, for economic growth, not good news for, for freight demand. Um, another one of the delayed releases, which was, was retail sales uh, from December. Uh, now, December's retail sales are, is, I mean, is a pretty important month to, to, to pay attention to because it's the busiest, busiest month of the retail season, um, just looking at, at a seasonal basis. Uh, and there was a, a, a surprising turn down in retail sales uh, right at the end of the year. And so I, th I think going into last month, I would have said everything looks pretty positive on the retail front, that job growth looks good, wage growth looks good, and uh, consumer confidence still looks pretty good, which normally translates into very strong retail activity. Um, but in this case, for, for one reason or another, retail just uh, just dropped significantly. And as a result, like the holiday season looks much worse than I think most people thought going into it. Uh, and you know, not only was it was it poor reading, but it was also very broad based. There was only a couple industries within retail that grew at all, like uh, motor vehicles had a pretty good month, 
and then building materials also had a pretty good month, but everything else just had declines across the board. Um, and so, you know, that, that it's part of the reason why we brought down our forecast for the fourth quarter. It also causes a little bit more doubt in, the, in sort of what the strength of the retail sector is going to be, which again, previously I would have said was one of the more consistent sources of strength for freight demand in the economy. Um, and so if you think about the holiday season in total, you can see that 2018 came in uh, around 2.9% for year over year for, for the holiday season in terms of retail. Um, keep in mind that I think the consensus for growth was getting close to about 5% was, was what was expected for holiday retail sales this year. So this 2.9% was uh, significantly lower than I think most would have would have thought. Um, to the point where I think there's, there's, there's been a lot of questions as to whether or not you can even trust some of the retail data that's coming out. Uh, if you take a look at like some of the, re some of the, what some major retailers were saying about the holiday season, um, I think the general feeling was pretty positive. You listen to earnings re re reports of a lot of, of, a lot of the retailers, uh, they reported pretty strong earnings. And so it's a big, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's hard to understand exactly why the, the overall retail numbers came in so poorly, but most of the anecdotal evidence surrounding it looked pretty positive. Um, now, you'll find some of those just say, well, we're just going to ignore completely the retail numbers, like they, they just can't be true, and, and kind of wishing it away. I don't, I don't uh, really follow that kind of path. I mean, I live and die by the data. So if the, if the, if the data changes, then I'll change my mind then. Um, but I'm not just going to dismiss it because I don't like the data that, that came out here. Um, but with that said, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's a, it's a sign of a long, of, of a significant problem within retail. I'm waiting to see what happens in some of the upcoming months. And just to talk a little bit about why I'm not panicked over retail after the, the week December numbers, I still think most of the consumer fundamentals look pretty solid going into the early parts of this year. I mean, normally you can think about retail activity and consumer spending as being like the combination of like how much people are able to spend on things and then how willing they are to, to spend on things, right? And so when you're talking about the, the ability to spend on things, you look at things like job growth and wage growth and income growth and credit conditions and all those things that allow consumers to buy uh, the, the things that are out there. And then the willingness to go spend or, you know, the desire to go spend speaks to things like consumer confidence uh, and, and things like that. And so normally if you have good job growth, good income growth and high confidence, that translates into to good retail activity and good consumer spending in the economy. Uh, and I still think most of those fundamentals are in place, right? That job growth uh, still looks strong. The past couple of months were very strong, both December and January. Wage growth has been above 3% over the past couple of months, year over year, which is strong, uh, especially in this post-recession era. Uh, and consumer confidence was, was hit a little bit by the government shutdown. Uh, like it took a bit of a hit in January, but I still think it's elevated relative to recent history. Um, you know, that, that's not to say the consumers don't have any headwinds. I think the, the, the recent tumble in the stock market in December probably played a role in some of the weakness. That, that's usually not good for consumer spending. But, the, the, you know, the sort of the broad picture of how U.S. households are doing, I still think is fine. And as long as that's the case, I think over the long run, retail spending is also going to be fine um, as, as you go forward. And so we'll, we'll wait and see how retail responds. Maybe there'll be a bounce back in January data. Maybe they'll go back in, in the December data and they'll revise it and say, okay, December wasn't as bad as we previously thought. But I think this, all of this kind of stuff will work itself out. On the industrial side, I think there's, there's quite a bit more questions. Um, you know, here I, I just put industrial production growth year over year. You can see in the third quarter of last year, there were some multi-year uh, highs that were hit. I mean, growth hit as high as 5.7% year over year. Um, but growth has come down since then. It, uh, as, of, as of the January data, it's at 3.8%. That's still pretty good, um, but I think it's trending in the wrong direction. There was a big decline in industrial production month over month in January. Uh, and I think there's quite a bit of headwinds facing the, the manufacturing sector. Uh, you know, when you think about like industrial output and manufacturing in particular, normally that gets driven by a number of things, right? So the, the, the consumer demand is going to help fuel a lot of domestic production, but also you're, you're, you know, you start to look at like what, what business appetite is for, for equipment, 
um, which I think has died down quite a bit. You look at the, the state of global growth and what that does to exports, which drives a lot of domestic manufacturing, and I think that that's also died down quite a bit over the past couple of months. Um, and then you look at things like the strength of the U.S. dollar, which will tell you how expensive it is to, to buy things um, from the rest of the world as opposed to domestically. Like the stronger the dollar gets, the easier it is for you to, to import things from the rest of the world because your dollar goes further in these further in these foreign purchases, uh, and the harder it is for you to export things to the rest of the world, which is both of those are bad for for manufacturing activity. Um, and, and so I think this combination of like weakening business demand a slightly stronger dollar and slowing down of, of global growth gives an, an awful lot of headwinds for the for the industrial sector and the economy. And then you throw on top of that that oil prices are still pretty low relative to where they were in the third quarter of, of next year. So you're not going to get the same sort of tailwind that you would have seen over the past year or so from the mining and energy sector, which drives a lot of um, industrial output in the economy. Uh, and so I think, you know, right now, uh, industrial production and manufacturing growth is still pretty solid, uh, but I expect this to, to continue to moderate going forward as well. Like I think as you get to the, the, middle, the middle of this year, towards the end of this year, you'll be looking at growth more in the two to two and a half percent range instead of this close to four percent year over year growth that we're seeing right now. Uh, similar kind of story you, you can see in, in, in the survey data. This is data from the Institute of Supply Management. Uh, now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the ISM data, it's essentially a survey of purchasing managers across several in industries, uh, and, and they ask about different aspects of business activity. So they'll ask about like pricing uh, and employment plans and production and uh, your new orders or the backlog of orders or inventories, like all these different categories. And the index number that, that comes out is the percentage of respondents that say that activity is expanding. So anytime you get a reading over 50, this means that more than 50% of the respondents are saying activity is expanding. If it falls below 50, that means that more than half are, are, are saying that activity is contracting. Um, and this is just the composite index of the overall manufacturing uh, ISM index. And you can see it's, it's clearly downshifted from where it was in the, in the middle part of last year. Like, uh, this is another one of the indicators that hit some multi-year highs in the, in the middle of, of, of 2018. And I think it's come down noticeably since then over the past several months. Uh, you can see in, in the January data, it registered 56.6. Again, that's not a bad reading at all. Like Historically speaking, a reading of 55 or higher usually means above average growth. So you get a reading of 56. Um, that's still growth that's slightly above average in, in the manufacturing sector. Um, but I think the point to remember is that it's just not going to be quite as strong as what you might have been used to uh, in the middle part of last year. And so when you're thinking about like freight demand, if you see that retail is dying down from where it was last year and trade is dying down from where it was last year and industrial production is also uh, and, and the manufacturing sector is also dying down from where it was uh, last year, you kind of get this picture that freight demand isn't the growth isn't going to be as strong as it was. So um, shifting gears a little bit just to talk a, a bit about policy. It's been a busy few weeks on the policy front. Um, on the fiscal side, I think the biggest news is that we have, uh, you know, the U.S. economy avoided another government shutdown. Um, you know, the, the first government shutdown had gotten to the point where it was beginning to cause real pain to the economy by the time it resolved itself. Uh, and it really wasn't clear that there was going to be a, a way out of avoiding a second one. And I think the second government shutdown would have been even more painful than the first one. Um, and so it's good, you know it's good news that you're you're able to kind of move forward without having to worry about the government not operating um, at least partially going forward. Um, you know, as part of the government shutdown resolution, you know, President Trump basically essentially declared a national emergency to try and build his border wall, and that allowed Congress to go ahead and sign. Uh, the, the, the budget funding agreement. The border wall itself, I, I don't think, at least from an economic standpoint, it doesn't make a big difference in terms of growth. Like it's not new money that's coming out to fund the border wall. Um, that's if the border wall even gets to, gets past the courts, which it, that even that is it really isn't clear. Um, but if the national emergency is declared and it's allowed to, to, to proceed, it's really just taking money that was already allocated for other purposes and redirecting it towards the border wall. Um, which means that you're just shifting money from one place to another. And so, and so from an economic growth perspective, it doesn't mean a whole lot, at least in the near term, 
uh, doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, there were some interesting things that came out of the State, the State of the Union address. I mean, the State of the Union address this year was, was pretty light on specifics, of course, but you know, you try to pay attention to themes to see what the president might be focusing on as, as his agenda. Uh, and there were a couple things that stood out as things that might potentially be areas for legislation uh, going forward. One was infrastructure, uh, the other was drug prevention. Now, drug prevention uh, programs, I mean, again, from an economic growth standpoint in the near term, I don't think has a big, uh, a big impact. Um, but an infrastructure plan, of course, would, would have significant Im uh, implications. Like if, if Congress and the president managed to come to some kind of agreement to fund infrastructure rebuilding, I think you, you, we would have to go back and revisit uh, what the growth projections look like for this year and, and next year. Uh, the pro I mean, n n normally, it's like infrastructure is something that you can get bipartisan support for. Like Democrats and, and Republicans both like the idea of taking the nation's resources and using it to to build up roads and things like that. Um, the the problem right now is that there's a bit of a difference in in terms of like how they view infrastructure investment, uh, where Democrats typically think of it as just being like you know you take government money and you use that to fund projects. I think the the Republican plans that have come out, or at least the plans that President Trump has put out previously were more of these like partnerships between private enterprises and, and the government that allowed private enterprises to, to build the infrastructure. And I think ultimately that's gonna be kind of what derails any kind of major infrastructure legislation uh, going forward. Like just it, not the fact that, you know, people don't realize that we need to rebuild some of the infrastructure that's out there. It's more of a, of a, of a disagreement on how that sort of thing gets done that's gonna ultimately hang it up. Um, I mean, I, I kind of said after the elections in November that I don't expect a whole lot to happen on a legis on, from a legislative standpoint over the next couple of years. Um, the government shutdown was like a it was a an, an early test to see how well like the president and the Democratic Congress and the Republican Senate could all work together, uh, and and that was basically a disaster. Like in terms of uh, in terms of how they were able to reach compromise, uh, and I don't expect a whole lot different going forward. Like I think this next year is probably going to be uh, quite a bit of fighting over the border wall and the national emergency and nothing gets done. Uh, and there'll be a, 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 just a series of of, of, uh, of stalemates between the president and Congress and things like that. So I don't, I don't think any major legislation is likely. On the monetary policy front, front uh, the Federal Reserve kept their rates constant in January, which I think most people expected. The Fed had been backing away from this idea of raising rates uh, as aggressively as it as it did in 2018 for several months now, and so when they they held tight in January, I think most people kind of thought that was going to be the way it was going to play out. Um, I would say that I think it's it, it, it's pretty likely now that there's going to be an extended pause in rate increases. Like I, for the foreseeable future, until the data starts to turn around. I don't think there's much of a case for them to raise interest rates even further than where they, they are now. In fact, you could argue that there wasn't a great case for them to raise interest rates as much as they already have, uh, given that inflation is still pretty low um, in, in the economy. So I think the Fed, for, at least for, for the time being, is going to hold off on interest rate increases, um, which in general is, is, I mean, it's good news for, for growth prospects because the higher the interest rate, the weaker consumer spending gets or the weaker business spending gets. Um, the one thing I would add to that, though, is that, you know, there's there's typically like a pretty long lag between when policy takes place with monetary policy and when you actually start to feel the effects in the economy. So it's not like the Fed says, OK, we're going to raise interest rates today and then tomorrow you get a reduction in consumer spending. It usually takes somewhere between uh, six to nine months before you start to feel the effects. And so what that means is that the, the economy is going to start to feel the effects of everything that happened in 2018 in the first half of 2019. Right, and so you're going to start to feel some of the pain from the previous interest rate increases, even if the Fed decides to hold off on raising interest rates even further than they have before. On the trade side, um, you know, at, at the end of last year, the U.S. and China already agreed to like a ceasefire in escalating their 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 trade war, um, where they decided you know there weren't going to be any additional tariffs put into place, and there was a three-month moratorium. Uh, on that front, um, but the, you know the deadline, that three-month deadline is coming up. So March 1st is is now when tariffs are scheduled to increase again. Um, and there's been some conflicting reports on how close exactly the U.S. and China are uh, on on reaching some kind of trade deal that will sort of 
relieve all of this all of this uh, terrible uh, uncertainty from the from the market. Um, the one thing I would say with that is I, I don't think there's it's likely to be to be a deal before the March March first deadline comes comes to pass. Um, but you know, there's always a chance that you can delay the deadline again. And, and I mean, President Trump has already signaled, like as long as as long as there's some signs of like a some progress is being made in trade talks, that he's willing to to delay the deadlines again. You know, for those of you that were back in uh, that attended market ways, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about tariff policy, and I remember saying at the time, like I don't, I think ultimately everybody realizes that nobody wants to have to go through these tariffs and actually implement them because it's bad news for the U.S. economy. It's also bad news for the Chinese economy. So nobody wins. And so I, I think they're just finding ways to delay things until they can come to some longer term resolution. I, I, I don't really expect that, that this March 1st deadline will pass and the tariffs will, will, will take place. And I think the likelihood of a deal being reached is probably higher than it, it's been over the past couple of months. Um, with that said, there's, there's, there's always something on the, on the trade front. Um, you know, quietly, the, the U.S. may begin instituting tariffs on European imports uh, fairly soon. Uh, the, 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 the Commerce Department had like a, a like an, invest, an investigation over the past several months as to whether or not like auto imports coming from Europe constitute a national security threat. Uh, and the findings of that report are, are, are now at uh, the, the president has seen them and he's indicated that, you know, if, if it proves to be a national security th threat, he's willing to slap like 25% tariffs on imports from uh, on European cars and auto parts and things like that. Um, which again, that's it's another one of those things. It's, it's not good news for, for the U.S. economy because it means higher prices for U.S. consumers. It, it's definitely not good for European economies. Um, Europe's already having a hard time growing right now. Like their economy has slowed down quite a bit, and tariffs on top of that is is really going to hurt uh, their their economy. So shifting gears and taking a look at, at the capacity side, uh, now that most of that dealt with, with sort of freight demand, um, typically when I when I think about capacity, I, I like to look at the at, at the number of employees within trucking. Like I think the big bottleneck within the trucking industry over the past year and some change has been the drivers. It's, it's, it's not necessarily how many trucks are out on the road, it's whether or not you can find drivers to drive the trucks uh, that are out there. Um, and I think the industry has done a pretty good job in, in terms of adding employees uh, over the past year. Um, trucking employment grew for the ninth straight month in, in January, added another 3,900 uh, jobs to, to payrolls. Trucking jobs are now up 2.9% year over year. Um, as compared to the overall economy, like an overall economy, job growth is about 1.7%. So trucking employment is, is quite a bit higher than that. Um, the one thing I would say within the transportation industry is when you look at the job openings rates, that's died down quite a bit. Uh, which means that that you know there's not as many openings for transportation jobs and warehousing jobs and trucking jobs as there, as, as there were um, say say five or six months ago uh, and, and so this is an indication that just uh, you know the trucking industry I think is still at least the labor market is still tight for truckers but I don't necessarily think it's any tighter than say employment just in general like it's it's hard to find a truck driver um, but it's hard to find workers across a lot of industries now. Like it's also hard to find construction workers. It's also hard to find manufacturing workers. And for a while, it looked like it was quite a bit tougher to find a trucking, uh, a, a trucking or transportation employee. Um, but recently, it, it, you know, the numbers coming out of that sector look very much like the rest of the economy. So we have um, a situation where you know it looks like capacity is being added to the market, and uh, demanded growth is slowing down. And so typically what this would mean is that there's less pressure for rate increases. Um, you know, one of the one of the big themes throughout 2018 was just that trucking was so tight and the economy was going growing so quickly uh, that, that rates had no choice but to but to surge. And you can see it uh, surge throughout throughout really the second half of 2017 uh, through 2018. Um, this here is the producer price index. This is a way of tracking prices that an industry receives. So this isn't this, this isn't the same as like looking at spot rates. Uh, that's only one part of the industry. This would include spot and contract rates and and uh, and, and things like that. Um, but the one thing I wanted to, to bring out there is that, I mean, you can see the year over year growth rate starting to die down here. Uh, the, uh, the, the producer price data for trucking actually declined 
uh, in January. So that's the first time in eight months that it actually had a month-to-month -month decline. Um, and the year-over-year -year growth rate is still pretty strong. It's at 8.3%. That's, um, again, in any other period, you would say, you know, that's, that's quite impressive. Uh, but it's down quite a bit from where it was in the middle part of last year. And I think as, as, as long as you have this environment of slowing growth in demand and increased capacity, you're going to find that these rates are going to moderate further going forward. Um, and so just to tie into some of this, this is actually one of the new indicators that we've added to, to Sonar over the past uh, couple of days, actually. Um, and it's, it, it's a joint project that, that's undertaken by a, a, a couple of universities that deal in, in supply chain and logistics. Uh, it's, it's called the, the Logistics Managers Index. Uh, and so this is work involved um, from, from professors from Arizona State, Colorado State, Rutgers University, uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Rochester Institute of Technology, like all these professors are, are, are working on this uh, Logistics Managers Index. And essentially what it is is survey data of logistics managers across different industries, right? And so these are going to be the people that are involved in, you know, that are are responsible for managing like transportation and warehousing spend for for different companies uh, and what they do is they, they they ask these logistic managers about different aspects of logistics activity and they want to know whether or not that activity is expanding or contracting um, so this, this is very similar to like the institute of supply management data the ism data any number above 50 means that like more than half of the respondents are saying activity is expanding if it falls below 50 it means that uh, more than half of the respondents are saying that activity is contracting. And so when you look at the Logistics Managers Index, you can see elevated readings all throughout 2018. I mean, you saw readings above 70% through most of, of, of 2018. Um, but then once you get towards the end of the year, you start to see it die down a bit. The, the, the transportation and our housing activity is, has cooled off a bit from where it was, uh, say, in the middle part of 2018. So this ties in with a lot of the other things that we see in the macroeconomic data and in our own data in terms of, uh, of how uh, active the freight, uh, freight and transportation and logistics markets are. When you drill down into the logistics managers index, again, they capture a number of different aspects of activity, um, but I wanted to pull out a couple of, of key components. Uh, here, the, the, the white line is capacity within transportation, um, and then the green line here is pricing for transportation. Uh, and the, the, uh, you know, what I wanted to bring out here is that when you look at the capacity index, it was well below 50 for most of, of 2018. So this is a sign that capacity is contracting, contracting or very tight uh, in the transportation industry. Um, but over the past several months, it's, it's been improving. Uh, and you can see sort of towards the end of, of, of 2018, it actually crossed above this 50 threshold, moving from this contractionary territory to expansionary territory, saying the capacity is expanding. Uh, within transportation. And at the same time, you get sort of the reverse effect in pricing that as capacity was tight, pricing was, readings were very high. Uh, you can see the pricing readings were almost at 100%, so 95% of the respondents saying that pricing within transportation were, were rising. Uh, but again, that's died down over the past several months. Uh, it's dipped down to about seven, a little bit below 75. Um, again, tying to this idea that, I, you know, I, I think that the idea that capacity is returning to the market and that's relieving some of the pricing pressures uh, that had been there in the industry over the over most most of the last year and a half. All right, thanks, Ibrahim. I will take it from here. So, national freight volume has basically been, you know, it's been flat for the first uh, 17 days of February. Uh, you, you see kind of this bottoming in late January that happened, uh, and then all of a sudden we had this big surge of the end of month volume freight. So it's it's kind of been a very you know slow month, but traditionally February is a slow month. There has been a few spots in the market though that are worth paying attention to. Um, we have pulled up here a year over year chart of uh, what basically the percentage change in volume year over year in some of the biggest markets in the country. This is Atlanta, Philadelphia, Chicago, Seattle, Dallas. Uh, I don't have Los Angeles on here because it's its own uh, kind of entity if you will, at the moment, and we'll dig into that here in a minute. But the year kind of started off real strong. Uh, we had, uh, you know, year over year increases in volume starting at the beginning of January. But over time, those volumes have kind of degraded and come back down to earth. Uh, we're kind of falling into this more what we would consider a normal type of year. Uh, Seattle being an exception, of course, uh, the Northwest is showing kind of anomalous uh, increases in volume as we've entered uh, into the new year and, and February specifically. Um, 
So, you know, some of the bigger markets like Atlanta that uh, tend to stay relatively quiet, they've now dropped below uh, what they were a year ago, whereas beginning the year, they were a little bit stronger. Um, so they're about 5.18% lower than they were this time last year. And Chicago is actually down about 15%, which is quite concerning, uh, considering all of the uh, volume in the Midwest does tend to bleed into the rest of the country. Um, so Los Angeles has been kind of the, uh, the market maker for the last half of 2018, really, as it, uh, you know, you see the chart here of the outbound tender market share, which is showing you a relative uh, volume on how much it, it has in the overall uh, market. So if you think about, about the market as a big pie and that pie does not change size, uh, it's going to increase and decrease in pie slices over time. So the Los Angeles market took a big old chunk of uh, the market pie uh, back there in October, November, uh, and then it started taking even more here in January. And that was kind of uh, weird to us. So we, we started digging in a little bit more. And what we found was, uh, even though that a lot of the, uh, the inbound container freight had died off, um, you know, there was still this surplus of freight sitting around the ports and a lot of the warehouses around there. And that takes time to kind of disseminate into the marketplace. So you can see that the, uh, you know, the outbound market share for Los Angeles it almost correlates perfectly there in the beginning of January with uh, inbound volumes to Stockton, Ontario, and Phoenix. Uh, Ontario, of course, being the kind of Imperial Valley area just to the east of, uh, of Los Angeles, where there's a lot of warehouses, uh, a lot more real estate to deal with, certainly lower warehouse price. Uh, so everybody's kind of repositioning their freight, getting it into areas that are, uh, you know, better suited uh, for handling some of the storage of this freight, certainly at a cheaper rate. Um, and that has continued uh, throughout February so far. So this this movement, this repositioning of freight is, is literally like potential energy sitting in the freight market, uh, waiting to be unleashed on the rest of the country. Uh, so this is the Freitos Baltic Exchange Index uh, for rates coming from China, North America's West Coast. Uh, and that is overlaid on top of the outbound tender volume index for Los Angeles. So this, what the Freitos is doing is measuring the spot rate coming from China to North American West Coast, which the biggest ports on the West Coast are Los Angeles and um, the ports of Long Beach. So they have a high correlation with what kind of volume you see in outbound LA. Well, you see here that the rates have died off uh, starting in the new year, they kind of had a resurgence after after Christmas and New Year's, but then kind of picked up a little bit, but then never really got back going. Uh, now we've entered the Chinese New Year, uh, Lunar New Year, and things really are going to start kind of dying off over the next few weeks. Uh, but volumes are staying elevated out of LA, and that is simply because of all the stored up uh, freight that has been sitting there that is now getting kind of pushed out regionally. Uh, in terms of capacity, our outbound tender, tender rejection index is what we use to kind of measure overall capacity in the market. The higher this rate goes, uh, as carriers are rejecting more loads, that's an indication that capacity in the market it has also declined because if carriers have better options to go out and either get a better rate or they simply just don't want to service that freight because they have a better option in the area, uh, maybe the truck is 300 miles away, uh, and they're just not willing to reposition that truck into the market to carry that load. There's several reasons, but those tend to be the main ones. Last year, we kind of saw, as you see, uh, tender rejections well into the, you know, the 20s, and they dropped slowly into the uh, teens over the course of the fall before kind of really uh, bottoming out here in the end of January. And now they've kind of stabilized and flattened out throughout February. Uh, they've only declined about 0.6%. Uh, since the start of February, or 0.06% since the start of February, uh, six basis points, I should say. Um, so that kind of is an indication that the market might have found kind of a soft bottom for the moment. Uh, that's kind of what we would expect in February. Here in the next two to three weeks, though, we, we would expect this number to start climbing up as the market starts to see some of these spring volumes. You get less, uh, you know, impact on the weather. Uh, you're going to see people get outside more. That'll kind of reinvigorate, uh, you know, hopefully the retail sector recovers a little bit here in the 
in, in the spring when things warm up, people tend to be a lot more active. Uh, considering my experience in the industry, March is typically your your month that's going to lead the year uh, and tell you how it, how the rest of the year is really going to be. That wasn't necessarily the case a couple of years ago in 2017 when it was a very soft March, and then all of a sudden uh, everything went haywire in uh, in the middle of the year around June. Uh, but we're not seeing any indication that that's going to be the case this year. We do kind of expect a slower uh, year so far, uh, specifically the, even though the market should recover into March, I'm not expecting a lot of, you know, elevated tender rejection rates uh, going into this March. Uh, kind of the regions that are showing the highest rejection rates at the moment are some of the ones that you would expect and also some that you really wouldn't. Uh, the Midwest is leading the country in tender rejection rates. We've had a series of uh, weather events, of course, that help contribute to some of that as carriers tend to avoid uh, the far northern regions. And we have had some decent volume coming out of these areas, even though they are down year over year in Chicago, uh, kind of the Milwaukee's and uh, some of those northern points in, the, in Mich Michigan has had a pretty decent uh, winter so far. Uh, a lot of these areas are covered in snow and ice. Uh, carriers simply don't want to go in there. Uh, drivers don't want to go in there. It's not safe to operate. Um, but that's kept tender rejection rates a little bit higher, even though volumes are slightly down year over year. Uh, it's just simply not been a very active year in terms of that. But also Chicago houses kind of the number one stop for any freight coming from uh, the West Coast in terms of rail volume, intermodal volume, if you will. You know, Memphis, Chicago, those tend to be kind of their number one targets, Atlanta, uh, for any kind of intermodal volume. And they'll hop off the train in Chicago and kind of push back into the uh, the middle of the country uh, just to save some money. But so far, it looks like that hasn't really exploded just yet, but we would anticipate here in the next few weeks for that to change a little bit, uh, specifically in the Southeast. Now, the Northwest has had uh, some pretty big weather events as well. Seattle has had more snow than it's used to, uh, getting several feet, if I'm not mistaken, over the last couple of weeks. And that has impacted tender rejection rates in that area. They're operating, the Northwest is operating around a 9.24, which is somewhat atypical, uh, considering that the Northwest time of year should have already passed. Uh, so I wanted to illustrate that, you know, the market, I know it's kind of beating a dead horse, but the market is, has softened uh, quite a bit over the last, uh, I'd say, several weeks to a month. Uh, but we did hit, uh, in the Atlanta to Philadelphia uh, lane, we hit the lowest rate that we'd hit since 2017, February 2017. So in February 2017, we hit $1.54. Um, and then just recently, uh, it hit back down to around a dollar fifty. So that didn't stay there very long, but it is noted that the markets at that time in 2017 were far different than the market now. Uh, the market is way more volatile and sensitive now to movements. Uh, what you see there in the chart is a Bollinger Band. It's a financial instrument used to measure volatility. Basically, the wider that band gets, the more volatile the, the market is at that point in time. Um, so whenever you see a Bollinger Band or that band kind of expand, uh, your kind of sensitivity to the market is going to be increased quite a bit. So any kind of, you know, significant freight event uh, that's going to, you know, any volume surges or anything like that are going to have a dramatic effect on that uh on the rate in that market. So Atlanta to Philadelphia is one of the most volatile mark or volatile lanes that we have on these rate indices, uh, moving anywhere from under a dollar fifty to over three dollars and fifty cents, which we hit this past June. So the rate has come down significantly, uh, sitting around a dollar sixty-five now. <clears throat> uh, but again, this market is pretty volatile, and we, we kind of expect that any uh, you know if if we do get a big spring or bigger than expected spring. Uh, this rate is going to go right back up really fast. So the next one is a seasonal, uh, a seasonality chart, which is going to show a trailing 12-month period stacked over previous years. And this is in the Chicago to Atlanta lane, which is actually one of the more stable uh, markets in the that we have on our freight indices, freight rate indices. Uh, these are developed for freight futures, of course, coming out in the uh, in the next month. Uh, what these are are a base rate <clears throat> that does not have fuel or any accessorials included in it. 
uh, no team transits or anything like that, uh, and they're supposed to be as clean of a methodology as possible, um, which is why they're, they tend to be, you know, they're pretty reliable in kind of judging what the market has done and where it's been. Uh, and right now you see the seasonality chart, which is displaying the current 12 months in the white line there, which has now fallen under last uh, or the previous 12 month trailing 12 month period of 2017, 2018. Uh, and that's significant because it's, it's dropped right below it this starting in October. Uh, it started to kind of move back together uh, over the holiday and now it's fallen back off again. Uh, but still noted is that it's still well above the 2016-17 uh, rates. Uh, we think the market has probably got a little bit of stickiness to it because uh, those contract rates, whereas they're not really you know, a permanent uh, solution for having a rate in the, in the market, as we found out last year with tender rejection rates increasing significantly, um, it's still going to create a little level of stickiness as shippers tend not to want to revisit any of their uh, their bid packages or propositions so soon after incurring, you know, uh, finalizing contracts because that process itself does take a lot of time. Uh, so there is going to be a little bit more stickiness to these rates, uh, we think, moving into the, you know, the spring months and summer months. So one of the things that Ibrahim hit on was the fact that we have tariffs and uh, things like that that are in play that are creating some uncertainty over import import volume. And we have the, the Freitos Baltic Index pulled up uh, the China to North American East Coast and the one coming from Europe to North America's East Coast. And you see that the volumes or the, the rate has actually come down in China to North America's East Coast, while the European one has shot up over the last week. Uh, this is pretty significant. Uh, in the way that we think that, you know, maybe there's been some supply chain reorganization. Uh, people have already kind of moved their freight into the country. Uh, maybe Savannah, for instance, is going to be the new port, uh, the new large port of interest for the uh, upcoming year, which would be have a significant impact on the freight market. Uh, that has to be seen yet, but the volumes out of Savannah right now are significantly higher, starting in the about October of last year, moving into this year, uh, and they remain high at this point. So, uh, the next one is the air cargo index. So we started monitoring air cargo uh, rates and volumes as well, but this one specifically measures rates. Uh, we have the air cargo rate from uh, Frankfurt to North America and also Hong Kong to North America. So it's basically an average rate of anything that ships out of the Hong Kong airport to North America, anywhere in North America and Frankfurt airport to anywhere in North America. You'll see there down at the bottom that the rate is actually ticked up. Uh, coming from Frankfurt to North America, which kind of coincides with what we're seeing in the uh, Freitos index, uh, which is the shipping or the maritime lanes, and this is in the air cargo lane. So we're seeing some interesting movement coming from uh, from Europe right now. Uh, we think that might have something to do with some of the autos and everything like that. So we have the uh, convoy index here that's kind of, you know, it, it, it it kind of backs up what we're seeing in the market right now. The Midwest, of course, supply is a little tighter up there, uh, specifically for all, all modes of transportation, reefer and dry van. The Southeast, it's having, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of middle of the road right now, whereas the West, everybody's been sitting out on the West Coast uh, for several months now, as there's been lots of uh, that container activity as they reposition the freight. So there's plenty of trucks, plenty of capacity out West right now, even though volumes are relatively elevated. Um, that kind of exposes some of the rest of the country because obviously people are going to want to go where the weather is nicer. <laughs> um, and the Midwest has been kind of getting hammered with a lot of cold, brutally cold weather. And this is a measure of uh, wait times uh, for pickup over the last several months. And you see that the wait times are starting to pick back up, which is an indication that the market might be on its way back up uh, as shippers are kind of less willing to kind of speed things up at their docks. Uh, they're going to get you loaded. Uh, they, don't, they don't really need to get you loaded as fast as they used to, um, specifically because they're not pushing as much freight. Uh, new truck orders. So looking forward, we had a huge year last year in terms of new truck orders. There's a backlog of over 300,000 units, according to ACT. Uh, you know, they seem to have started putting this order and all these orders in towards the end of the cycle last year. We saw capacity kind of really uh, 
go way down in the middle of the in the middle of the year and then all of a sudden it started recovering and just in time for everybody to get enough money to go out and put a bunch of orders in for some of the new uh the newer equipment coming in so this is kind of a standard overcorrection, uh and also by the time that you know the financial process gets done and everybody makes their orders and put and figures out exactly what they want you know the cycle is kind of already missed uh just to give a quick weather update uh, we have added some new features in sonar which i think is pretty cool this is actually a visual of what the road conditions are going to be like tomorrow morning at 7 a.m uh, so the reds are snow pink is ice uh, blue is wet and green is dry on the road conditions. So on the I-90 corridor tomorrow, uh, watch out. It's going to be pretty snowy going from Cleveland to Chicago. Um, it should be a pretty slushy start to an Indianapolis morning. So if you're out there uh, doing your early dispatch, uh, be careful on those roads. And We've had this weather pattern where a lot of the uh, a lot of these storms have come across the Pacific Northwest and just destroyed the Midwest. That pattern is starting to shift. Uh, you're still going to have you're going to have a lot more deepening cold going into the uh, West Coast. You're going to warm up slightly in the East, uh, basically as there's going to be a big trough over the West Coast, and you're going to have a bigger ridge over the East after we get through these next couple of storms that are going to dump a lot of wet weather over the east, uh, but that means that's good news for uh, skiers, bad news for truckers crossing some of those mountain passes. And last but not least, diesel uh, diesel prices are actually climbing right now, especially on the rack. The wholesale rates are coming up uh, pretty quick here in the last little bit. Uh, WTI just climbed to uh, $56 today. Uh, the retail price is slow to correct and react. That is going to compress some of these uh, dry or these uh, carrier metrics ORs going into the uh, you know uh, what is traditionally a slower time of year in the first quarter. So probably not going to get as much of a bump as you got in December. As you see that fuel spread right there between retail and wholesale was quite deep uh, ending the year. All right. All right. Hey, Zach. So just to summarize, um, I mean, again, I think the overarching theme within the freight market is it looks like uh, demand is slowing down quite a bit. Uh, when you look at uh, the manufacturing sector or, or housing or, or retail, like it, I, I think growth is still positive, but I think it's, it's clearly slowed down from where it was through most of last year, um, which, which has some implications for just uh, how tight the, the, the trucking industry is going to be going forward. Um, on the policy front, again, I think it's good news that we were able to avoid a second government shutdown. There's still quite a bit of uncertainty over trade policy, but even there, I think um, there's been some progress that's, that's made between the U.S. and China, which is also good news. Um, and then on the capacity side, I, I think uh, you know, most of the things that we track are saying the same sort of things, that, that capacity appears to be returning to, to the market, and that's making it harder to get the, the same sorts of rate gains that we would have seen last year. Awesome job, guys. Thanks so much to Zach and Ibrahim for sharing your insights here. We've got about seven minutes left, so if those of you listening in would like to ask questions and have not already submitted those through the Q&A button, please feel free to go ahead and do that, and we will jump right into Q&A. Um, so, Ibrahim, you just touched on, and also at the beginning of your presentation, touched on uh, the increase in capacity that we're seeing. Um, can you share a bit about the data uh, that points to that? Sure. Um, I mean, again, when you think about capacity, like it, it, I mean, it kind of depends on what period of time you're looking at. Like capacity can be affected by, by you know, truck production bottlenecks. It can also be uh, affected by just the the number of drivers that are out there that are available. And I think the latter is is pretty clearly the case, and has been the case over the past uh, say year and a half or so. That really the thing that's holding back capacity within trucking is the ability to to find uh, drivers to fill the trucks that are out there. It's not that they can't produce trucks fast enough. Um, and so, you know, when, when I try to gauge um, how that side of it, how the driver side looks, um, you know, the first thing I look at is just like the, the trends in, in trucking employment. And I showed the chart earlier that showed that the trucking employment had a, a very good year in, in 2018, and it's growing faster than you would find uh, in the rest of the economy. The one thing I would say about that is like the trucking employment numbers don't tell you the whole picture. Um, they tell you like official payroll statistics of so the number of, of drivers that are on payrolls. There's a, there's a, there's a whole other sector of the trucking market that's just 
you know, like a guy with a truck, like that, that sort of thing, um, that, that's never going to be captured in the BLS. It's not going to be captured on on that side of the BLS numbers. Um, and, and to that end, I, I actually think it probably underrepresents how fast capacity is being added. Um, and, and Craig and I talked about this a little bit last month, but I think technology has made it a, a bit easier now to be like an independent truck driver and find loads quickly um, than it than it would have been say five years ago or so. And so as a result, it's just easier for 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 for, for truckers to just join into the market. There's less barriers to entry there. Um, so I, I take a look at that. And then recently I've been looking at just like the number of openings within trucking and, and, and transportation just to see like uh, what, what, what job postings look like and how fast, the, you know, the number of job postings that are out there relative to the rest of the economy. Um, and I talked a little bit about that. I, those numbers have come down a little bit. So the pace of hiring may slow down a little bit going forward. Okay. Probably. And how do you expect the inventory onshoring from China to play out um, as it relates to freight trends? Well, I mean, it's a it, it's a good question. The, 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 so that it, it, it kind of revolves revolves around like how how this U.S. China thing resolves itself. Um, it, if tariffs actually get instituted uh, on March 1st as currently scheduled, then you probably have businesses starting to draw down inventories right after that. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, essentially, a lot of this importing activity over the past couple of months has been preparing for that kind of event. So if the event happens, then you'll start to see the, them draw down from their inventories now, not import as much from China. If you're still in this period where we're delaying deadlines um, and we, we haven't really resolved anything, but we're just kind of kicking the can down the road so we can get more time to figure it out. Uh, then I, I think the inventories probably just stay there, stay high until they get some some clarity on things. I mean, it also depends on the industry. Some industries you can keep inventory longer than others. Uh, if you have like a lot of clothing inventory, you obviously can't keep it on uh, just sitting there for year after year after year. It's also year. very expensive in California to keep it in California. <laughs> That's right. <so. laughs> That's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it just depends on how the U.S.-China situation plays out, um, which unfortunately is still tough to, to know for sure. Yeah. Got it. All right. And what is your outlook for WTI as the year unfolds? Do we finish the year higher or lower from where we are now? So it, it's um it's an interesting question. Like it, it's uh, <laughs> it's a hard one. Well, the, the the thing that I'll say is like people that forecast oil prices for a living, they have a very difficult time forecasting uh, what the price of oil is going to be. Um, just because there's so many variables from different aspects that go into like what the price of oil is going to be. Um, the, the two things that I would say to key on, one is like what the global economy is doing. Like I, I mentioned earlier that, that once you step outside of the U.S., it's pretty clear that like the slowdown is even more severe in like Europe and China and things like that. Uh, and so as the global economy slows down, that puts significant downward pressure on oil prices. Uh, right now, I actually think the price of oil is being propped up by a number of things. One is like Saudi Arabia decided that they were they were going to restrict the amount of oil that's out there. The second thing is everything that's going on with Venezuela, uh, the sanctions that are out there and the turmoil that's going on in Venezuela is keeping a lot of supply off the market. Um, and then the, the third thing is, is what, what's happening with Iran and uh, where they where they stand with, with sanctions there. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in theory, the price of oil could be significantly lower than what it is right now, but you just have all these things that are keeping it up artificially. Um, as long as those things stay in place, you would expect that oil would stay uh, around this $55 to $60 kind of range. Um, but Saudi Arabia can, and they have changed their mind uh, at, at the sort of the drop of a dime before, um, or you could get some um, or more concrete resolution in, in Venezuela, and then all of a sudden you're looking at lower oil prices than what you would have before. Uh, so I can't give you an exact outlook, but I can tell you the mechanisms that might uh, make it move <laughs> one way or another. All right, and we've got time for maybe one more. There are lots more questions here, um, but we will be able to reach out to you after the webinar and respond to those. So thank you so much for sending them along. Um, the last one, um, how do you square the weak government retail sales data for December with other readings issued by folks such as MasterCard, Walmart, et cetera, showing that retail was strong in December? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess that's the, that's, that's the big question in the economy right now. Um, my answer is that I generally take retail as a as a, a, a much broader environment than any single number, um, especially any single month of any particular number. Like government data can do weird things from month to month for for any number of reasons, um, and, and so 
I don't completely dismiss the government readings, um, but I take it as part of a broader picture that includes all the other things that are out there. Like, for example, the government data said that like online sales did terrible in December, but Amazon came out and they said that they crushed December, <laughs> and, and Walmart said that their on online segment did really well in, in December. So what do you believe? Well, I mean, you, you take it all as, as part of a big thing. Uh, you know, maybe Amazon isn't the whole picture. Maybe there's some weakness elsewhere that you might be missing. Uh, but then again, maybe the government data isn't the whole picture either. Like maybe government data is doing something weird. Uh, the one thing that I would say is like these kind of disconnects, they don't last long. Um, when they happen, they're like these one kind, one time like anomalies. And, and one thing will correct or another. Like, uh, you know, either the government will come back next month and say like January sales were amazing and everything looks back to normal. Or they'll come back and they'll say like, ah, oh, December wasn't as bad as we originally thought. We took in some more data and now it looks much better. Uh, and, and in the end, you'll, you'll come back to some to a better, more cohesive picture of it all. Um, but the reality is like there really is, I mean, there is a disconnect there right now. And it, and it is tough to square. Right. Awesome. All right. Well, everyone, that is all the time we have for today. So thanks so much, so much to Zach and Ibrahim uh, for being here to share your insights today. And thank you again to our partners at Convoy uh, for partnering with us to bring this content to you all. Be on the lookout for next month's webinar invitation in your email here in the next couple of weeks. And if you have not already registered, please uh, be sure to visit www.transparency19.com uh, to check out our transparency event, which is going to be taking place May 6th through 8th in Atlanta. Tickets are currently available for $13.95 um, for the three-day event, and the price will increase to $15.95 starting March 1st. So go ahead and lock in that low rate uh, while you still can. Thanks again for joining us, everybody, and we hope you'll be here with us again next month.